All righty there, folks. We are looking at the weather. Whether we like it or not, that is some amazing stuff. Flooding, a lot of flooding, a lot of flooding. Welcome to the Doug Wright Show. Welcome one and all. Negro news and narrative. That is my imperative. How are you? Welcome, one and all. We're going to spend some time together, you and me. We're going to be looking at the weather, you and me. We're going to see what we see because there is so much to see. Please like, subscribe, and listen to me. I am here. Lend your ear. This is an unannounced event. All right. Uh, how's everybody doing? Uh, it's 9.13 here in the evening here, and uh, I am Doug Rice. I am Doug Rice. So here it is, man. Uh, look at the weather. Look at it. Uh, you know, wow. I know you got better things to do, and how I know you do, but uh, we're going to talk about some things. I got uh, some of the things I'd like to talk about might be best done unannounced. I've determined that there may be a few things uh, that I may bring to you uh, that might, in fact, uh, be worthy uh, of being brought to you unannounced. So without any, uh, any kind of warning, do it uh, rather now than in the morning because, well, I got to be up <laughs> yawning. So I prepared something a few days ago. And uh, as we watch uh, the, uh, the weather take hold, you guys can do me a favor if you do, if you would not mind. I mean, it's going to take a while for folks to find me again. So like, subscribe, share. We're going to be talking about something uh, that's uh, going to be interesting to hear. Again, brought to you by Twidware. That is who we are with. So uh, here's the thing, folks. The weather is crazy. The weather outside is frightening. It is. Uh, but the news can even be more, uh, more of an alert. And the reason I bring it up is because I got something I want you to check out. I want you to know. I want you to tell me if you knew about this. I don't know if you did, but did you know that there were Jews who fought for Nazi Germany? Did you have any clue? Because I did not know. And I'm not uh, disparaging these individuals who thought, who, who thought uh, you know, probably what was best for their personage. But uh, let me give you the title. It says, The Jews Who Fought for Nazi Germany. Now, that's an interesting title, isn't it? So while we take in uh, this information by Ellen Feldman, written on August 4th, 2020. Here we've got Helmuth Wilberg. Helmuth Wilberg. Now, this guy is a German officer of Jewish ancestry. He was the last general of the Luftwaffe during the Second World War. Now, you look at this guy and you see that he is a Jew, but uh, there's, uh, you know, he's also a, a, a German soldier, too. So we're going to get into this. Uh, we're going to let the folks come in. Uh, hopefully, you will not have missed this and maybe get the gist of, you know, how this all came about. Uh, I will tell you, uh, without doubt, I do not. Uh, I do not take any ownership of the information that I find, uh, nor would I feel that to be something I do or be so inclined. I would not do that. Uh, I love giving uh, credit where credit is due, and I hopefully you do as well, too. You're going to hear something. Don't be alarmed. The juice. Oh, okay. I'm sure your ears haven't been harmed. So how's everybody doing? Doing good? like subscribe share there's four people in here that's plenty enough three more than i need in fact there's just one that 
really needs to heed these words. It's me. Uh, and that's uh, what I see. So the Jews who fought for Nazi Germany. That's going to be the title of this. I'm going to let the uh, I'm going to let the I'm going to let the reader do the reading, and uh, any points I find, I won't miss. Here we go. The Jews who fought for Nazi Germany. Traitors or survivors, cowards or brave men, fools or wise heeders of Jewish parables on the sanctity of each individual life. So that's the opening salvo. And of course, uh, Ellen Feldman is the author written on the fourth. Well, let's find out what happened. I want to know uh, what's happening. So they're going to be asking some questions. And if uh, if you have uh, anything you'd like to ask, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how long this might last, but I'll see if I can get on the task. Here we go. Oop, excuse me. Well-connected area oh, spots. Wait, wait, wait. Oop, there we go. Helmuth Wilberg, a German officer of Jewish ancestry, was the last general of the Luftwaffe during the Second World War. That's him. What was the safest place for a Jew in Hitler's Germany? A cellar or an attic? A forest? At home with a well-connected Aryan spouse? The answer was in Hitler's military, in the Wehrmacht, the Kriegsmarine, or the Luftwaffe, at least until the tide of war turned and all three began to suffer staggering losses. Some said the Luftwaffe was the best bet because Goring protected his own. Whichever branch, wearing a uniform was like slipping into a coat of armor or invisibility. Again, uh, how are you? My name is Doug Rice. This is just an impromptu live this evening. I put together this, uh, this uh, well, for, uh, for a, a future show. And one of the th thoughts was, just so you know, the reason I did not have a good uh, 5.30 uh, uh, live uh, is because I, I, I let too much cat out of the bag for it to survive. So I wanted to spring this on you and hopefully you know what to do. Like, subscribe, share. What we're talking about uh, is the uh, Jews in uh, German, the Jews who fought for Nazi Germany. That is the name of this uh, live. And also we'll look at some news and uh, we'll see how long we survive. Okay, here we go. I made this astonishing discovery while delving into the literature of the war and the Nazi occupation of France for my novel, Paris Never Leaves You. According to Hitler's Jewish Soldiers by Brian Mark Rigg, thousands of full Jews and more than a hundred thousand part Jews joined the military of the Third Reich. The stories of these men and of the psychological as well as the physical hazards they endured altered the book I had originally set out to write. Okay, so this was a book attempt, and again, uh, Ellen Feldman writing uh, regarding Jews who fought for Nazi Germany. Uh, please like, subscribe, share. Remember that we are brought to you by Twidware. Twidware is some quality sports gear. They have skin care. They've got, they've got footwear. They've got beard oil. I mean, hey, uh, go to twidware.com. Go there. Go use the the promo code TDRS for the Doug Rice Show. Get 10% on any purchase, just so you know. Like, subscribe, and share. There we go. Some of the Jewish men who fought in Hitler's military had been drafted. Others were patriots whose fathers, grandfathers, and uncles had served in the Imperial Army in World War I and dutifully enlisted. One survivor described himself as a German first and a Jew second. Jewish allegiance to Germany in the early days of the Third Reich is one of the great unrequited love stories of history. So not uh, not just uh, not just us. Uh, there are Uncle Toms in every single demographic, every peoples, every tribe, every quote unquote race, if you so imbibe. But uh, what an interesting th thing to say. And I wonder uh, in his day, I wonder how it ended. Uh, I wonder if that statement he would have amended. That's interesting. He said he was a German first and a Jew second. Wonder how that wound up for him. Many of these Jews believe the Nuremberg racial laws and the rising tide of anti-Semitism did not apply to them. 
They were not Ostjuden, whom they perceived as uneducated and superstitious. German Jews were cultured. They were patriotic. Many could trace their roots in Germany back for generations. One officer who served in the Waffen SS was the descendant of Jews who had fled the Inquisition and settled in Germany for centuries earlier. Some German Jews even tried to halt the influx of their co-religionists fleeing the persecution and pogroms of Eastern Europe for fear that the presence of these unassimilated Jews would undermine their own social standing. But to Hitler, a Jew was a Jew. It didn't matter where he came from, how well educated he was, what he wore, how, or even if he worshipped. In April 1940, the directive came down to purge the military of all Jewish blood. Jews and part Jews, Michelin's to the Nazis, map among themselves, after a cocktail popular in Berlin at the time that was half sweet and half bitter, were told to turn themselves in. Many did. Some commanding officers told their Jewish soldiers to remain quiet and go on as they were. The officers wanted their best and most experienced men for the imminent invasions of Western and Northern Europe. World conquest trumped racial purity. Oh my goodness, isn't that a isn't that a sight for interested eyes that you know some of those folks just let those guys slide by. They just considered that it was better to have the most qualified and well, that's interesting. Let's continue. One Gentile lieutenant, a member of the Nazi party in the SA, who tried, unsuccessfully, to save one of his half-Jewish soldiers, was incredulous that the Wehrmacht would drum a man with an iron cross out of its ranks. A few Jewish soldiers who were forced to leave were thrown farewell parties and sent off by their colleagues with the wistful comment that the departing soldier was a lucky so-and-so to be getting out of it. One such soldier who was envied by his colleagues took a darker view of matters. He had a fairly good idea of the future he faced with roundups, work camps, and concentration camps. Now, let me tell you why this is uh, extremely important for Negroes to pay attention to. Now, now I, um, I for one, am not an alarmist. I didn't get here, uh, you know, on, on this live to, to foment fear, but we are in the exact same pre-Nazi war state that Germany was uh, before World War II. Uh, and that is not an exaggeration either, I'll tell you. This is serious business. We are in trouble. And in sounding the alarm, <laughs> you know, the, I'm thinking about doubling down on it. Uh, and, and here's the reason. I will not be the Jew that stays. I, I, and, and I'm not going to be uh, the Negro that got played. Now, there are some of you that call that flea doctrine. Uh, I can't go anywhere. I'm just prepared to go somewhere up here first. But um, I, I think it's imperative that we understand where the United States is in its future development and, and exactly what it has to do. And I don't think too many of you have thought about this, too. You know, they're talking about putting these people into chains, right? I mean, they're, they're, they're going into slavery, no matter how unsavory. There they go. So how do they get there? How do they get to slavery from here? And they're going. Oh, dear. They're going, right? We're knowing, right? And what are they good for now? More importantly, they've... They, they really have no other purpose than to be frightening, frightened individuals, energized by their own injury, like raw nerves. And that in itself, that as they are. Now, understand the uselessness of Americans is established by far. But that's not going to be enough to put them into slavery. They got to be doing something a little bit more. Yeah, I'm going to say it, unsavory. What if the calculus has been made? What if within the plans that are being laid, what if they're letting the trouble be made here in the United States amongst these hissing snakes? What if? 
It's the ideation that they allow this racist, self-centered nation to go all in with the sin of their kin. What if it was, what if it, it's in their imagination? Consider what I mean. These are abhorrent beings, right? And they hide it so well, man. Jesus, they can sell, man. But we know it's behind their smile and we know it's utterly vile. We know, we know their style. And it has to be allowed to be brought out without, a, without an understanding or an undoubt. They gotta show the cards they're playing. You gotta know what I'm trying to say. You know it. And they're watching them too. The only way they're gonna get chains around their wrists if they simply cannot resist to be the kind of racist people they insist we see. But hey, what do I know? Don't listen to me. Oh, I'm sorry, did I go on a, I did go on a drift. Well, you all need a little lift, what you want. Let's continue. A few Jewish soldiers who were forced to leave were thrown farewell parties and sent off by their colleagues with the wistful comment that the departing soldier was a lucky so-and-so to be... I thought I was the only one that repeated. That's interesting. All right, so he had a fairly good idea of the future he faced uh, with roundups. And uh, while I found my place, uh, let me turn the sound up. <laughs> we don't want to be a disgrace, but all right. The dire consequences of some confessions of Jewish blood were more immediate. One commanding officer, infuriated at having his ranks sullied and himself hoodwinked, took out his service pistol and shot the offending Jewish soldier dead on the spot. I'm sorry, what? What did he do? Wow, that's pretty intense. Whew, okay. Other Jewish men falsified their papers, but forged documents still left the problem of the telltale circumcision. Living in constant terror of exposure, many were ready with a story of a childhood infection that resulted in the removal of a foreskin. Now, can you imagine having to explain to some dude from Ukraine that, <laughs> I mean, wow, in the shower too, huh? And if you don't got the right answer, it's pow, it's over, huh? I mean, wow, that's a, you know that's a hell of a way to live. And we're headed in that direction. I'll say it again for your Negro protection. We are about to go that far. This country is about to push the envelope. This country is about to say yes and not nope. It's going to be a, a white supremacist ideology that that uh, envelops this whole country. You'll see. I just don't want you to be cut. I just don't want you to be caught unaware. I don't want you to be, you know, wondering why they stare. I just don't want you to be standing there. Just get packed, Negroes. We're out of here. All right. Where was I? Was I right there with the whole circumcision thing? Yeah, that's. Uh, here we go. What more disgust it brings. Others, when told to pull their foreskins back during physical inspections, pretended to with a sleight of hand. Wait, oh, wait, what now? Hold on, wait, you had to, what? You had to, y'all, did y'all get that right there? That don't really sound that that could be done. That doesn't sound like, I don't know, they'd start to run. <laughs> That's, hold on, now, I want to replay that because I want to frame that correctly. What, what's going on here is that Jewish men, Jewish you know, folks are, are, are in Hitler's army. This is what this article is about. I snuck it in so that nobody could you know, try to suppress it. And so the Jews that fought for Nazi Germany had to somehow how manipulate the foreskin to somehow assimilate that there was some there, but there was none there, and it's gotten pulled out of thin air. Try that. Others, when told to pull their foreskins back during physical inspections, pretended to with a sleight of hand. A Wehrmacht veteran who managed to pass muster during barracks checks was found out by a French prostitute while on leave in Paris. How, what? Hose is telling? 
He believed she never turned him in because they were both outcasts. How did those Jewish men rationalize serving a regime that was out to destroy them and their families? How did they justify masquerading as Aryans? <laughs> the second question is easier to answer than the first. And the first question is how did they rationalize serving a regime that was out to destroy them and their families? That's a damn good question I would ask that. Also, how did they justify masquerading as Aryans? Yeah. Well, Most of them, especially those who were only part Jewish, didn't feel as if they were masquerading at all. Even those whose Jewish parent had remained Jewish had often been brought up as Christians. They did not identify as Jewish. So what is being Jewish in reality then? If we look at it from the objective perspective of these individuals, there is really no connective. They are ready to be as, uh, you know, as separate as they need to be uh, on a whim. I mean, I mean, I know that's them, but still, uh, won't, uh, won't others will? I'm sure they will. They knew nothing of Jewish practice or observance, custom or law. They had married Gentiles and were raising their own children as Christians. So being a Jew is optional, even if you're born a Jew, supposedly, but you're really not because you're a convert. What? I, I mean, so they can cast off the jewelry they have cast on, and they can they can just be who, whoever they want to be whenever they want to. Wow, that's interesting. For many of them, the discovery of Jewish blood came as a shock, and not a pleasant one. It would be easy to raise the cry of self-hating Jew, but discovering an unexpected persona can unsettle the most grounded or decent human being, especially when the penalty for this uninvited guest could be death. No, yes, and in that respect, I would absolutely pardon anything they did to protect themselves, collect themselves, connect themselves with Aryan Nazism. Yeah, if they did not see it coming, if they didn't see that they needed to be running. Well, of course, at that point, do what you need to do to survive. I'm talking about those conscious Jews saving their lives. Those are the ones that we're questioning. So a little bit objectionable. Let's just continue. Oh, I'm sorry. My mental sin. His Jewish ancestry only at the age of 18 when his mother confessed. He felt as if his entire world had been turned up. Stop. I clicked somewhere. Here we go. Boom. Here and then. A half-Jewish officer whose maternal grandparents had converted to Christianity for economic and social reasons and baptized their daughter, learned about his Jewish ancestry only at the age of 18 when his mother confessed. He's excused. He felt as if his entire world had been turned upside down. Previously confident of himself and his heritage, he suddenly felt like a member of an inferior species. Now that's got to be brain lock on this guy. Can you imagine? Oh my. Some of the disgruntled applied for special dispensation. Hitler could make anyone an Aryan by fiat. What? So he can make a black dude an Aryan? He could just say, you're an Aryan, just despite, wow. He did just that with the Miss Slinges Field, Marshal Ohart Melch, General Der Flieger Helmuth Wilberg, and others who had proved their military value. <laughs> One photograph of Wilberg shows him resplendent in uniform with no fewer than 12 medals pinned to his proud Aryan, formerly half-Jewish, chest. Nonetheless, despite Wilberg's altered religious status, he insisted that he fought not for the Fuhrer, but for fatherland in Volk. Let me tell you something about that fatherland, not Fuhrer nonsense that some of them invoke. That is utter dribble, okay? And not, a, not, and not even a little, okay? Uh, the German World War II uh, connection to World War I is near perfection. So all of the generations that were in this conflict are simply, uh, are simply, you know, a passed on generational connect with that war in itself. So there is no fatherland for Volk. The reason, and let me say this so you know, 
the reason that he wanted to fight for the fatherland, and let's just say not for the Fuhrer, is the same reason the Fuhrer became the Fuhrer in the first place. There ain't a, uh, I, don't, I don't know there wasn't a man who served in the Nazi army whose perhaps father, family, relative was not connected somehow to uh, the, well, the, the, the payback that Germany had to give. When you talk about reparations, Germany had to give reparations to the French, to the French uh, that would uh, break most countries and broke them. So he, the fatherland still invoked the Aryan white nationalist assertion that was in the very heart of World War I. Most people don't understand that. And uh, all of this was promulgated by outsourced sources. sources birth. And, and just to give you a heads up, uh, this, uh, this global ripple, uh, which began... Uh, let's just say the French Revolution, all right, all the way through the American Revolution into the War of 1812, into the uh, American uh, Civil War, into World War I and the World War II, all connective tissue into one confluent group of individuals who became the causality of all those conflicts by funding all of them, both sides. If you don't believe me, don't believe what, you know, that what I present to you, just uh, check my math, all right? All of the wars that have been fought since the French Revolution were funded uh, by the Rothschilds. And that's a fact that should bring great smiles, because it's true. It's absolutely true. You know, wars don't get fun, wars don't get fought for free. And whatever you do, don't listen to me. Check my math and uh, then go have a laugh. Here we go, let's get back to it. All right, where were we? I don't even know, I'm hoping this thing does, let's see. The distinction was a common refrain among Hitler's Jewish military men and some Aryans as well. But one of the Jews who served in Hitler's military and not only identified as Jewish, but remained observant. Many of them, like another Waffen SS officer, continued to say prayers and observe other rituals secretly in the barracks or, more desperately, on the battlefield. How did they justify fighting for a regime that was taking away their rights, murdering their families, and labeling them subhuman? Okay, once again, this is the Doug Rice Show. I am Doug Rice. Just wanted to stop tell you what we're talking about in case you didn't know. This is what we're talking about. Jews who fought for Nazi Germany, like uh, this guy, Helmuth Wilberg, a German officer of Jewish ancestry and the last general. So uh, just wanted to give you a heads up on that. Please be sure to like, subscribe, share, do all of the things you like to do, and uh, I'll appreciate you. Some believed they could save their families by serving. One Michelin's told of going to a Gestapo jail to help his Jewish father only to learn that the man had been sent to Dachau. Ouch. He then volunteered in the Wehrmacht, hoping it would help his father's plight. It didn't. Ooh. Two brothers, whose Gentile father had divorced their Jewish mother when the racial laws were promulgated, made a point of wearing their uniforms when they visited her. She was nonetheless sent to a camp. Wow. Some cold folks, huh? Man, Dachau, Treblinka, Auschwitz, Buchenwald. You know, I, I'm going to say this because it's important that we know it all, okay? Uh, you got folks over in the Middle East, to say the least, they're feeling their yeast, right? I mean, they're, they're taking a lot of air, and there's a lot of shit going on over there. But that situation was created through the rescue that was abated by soldiers like those that went over and rescued these beings. And now look over there and see what we're seeing. This is where they were rescued from. And now they're kind of playing dumb. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? I'll get back to it. I didn't mean to do that. I'm just trying to, you know, do, okay, let's just go. Some sell their consciences with self-delusion. Nazi ideology was one thing, but surely their fellow soldiers who wore the same uniform 
had the same needs and fears, instincts, and feelings, must have an essentially human heart beating beneath that uniform. I don't know if it's a human heart. I mean, it's a, it's a heart. It's a heart. We'll just say it's beating. But is it a human heart? Surely they would not mistreat and murder their fellow soldiers' mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, grandparents. Yeah, but they did, though. The Waffen SS officer whose family went back 400 years in Germany. 400 years? Called his comrades the best anyone could want in war, though, he added. If they'd known he had Jewish blood, they would have strung him up from the nearest tree. Wow. It's kind of harsh. What a way to live. Somebody find out you're other than what you project and there's nothing there to protect the... Okay. A few, especially on the Russian front, would claim later that while they served in Hitler's army, they helped save the lives of other Jews in lands where they fought and conquered. An Orthodox Jewish Wehrmacht lieutenant told of giving secret passes to Jews who'd been rounded up the SS in Lithuania, Latvia, and Russia, and food to starving Jewish children in a Russian village. Years later, when he met another Orthodox Wehrmacht officer at a conference in Bonn, they agreed that they'd done more for Jews by staying in the military than had those who'd fled the country before the war. Who among us who wasn't there can say they didn't? But, and, you know, that's a very good point. Uh, you can imagine the assistance given to those in the resistance, but I'm uh, looking at this on face value, and I don't know. I, you know, there's, there's a dichotomy in this entire equation. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I don't know. There's a little bit of evasion. Perhaps the answer to their moral quandary lies in another question. What else could they have done? Good point. Refusing to serve, trading in their father's or grandfather's Iron Cross for their own Yellow Star would have sent one more member of the family to Auschwitz. A Wehrmacht lieutenant maintains that he always felt Jewish inside, but military service was the only hope for survival. Another veteran felt certain that God guided him into the military to save his life. That is not a bad justification. We all use it in some way, and even the Negro Nation, I don't know. What can I say? We'll see, though. When asked why God did not save six million others, he replied that the Almighty's actions cannot always be understood. He said that? He said that? Anecdotal testimony, however, suggests that most of the men who served in Hitler's military lost their faith during the war, if they'd ever had it. As one soldier put it, after his face had been sprayed with the brains of a comrade, he decided God did not exist. Uh, that couldn't do it. That's not going to do it. You know brains are in there. You know if you get shot, they're going to hit your face. You know if you're in close enough proximity, it's going to be all over the place. That should not take away the fact that God exists. In fact, in fact, that might even be more of a reason to insist. Another force that encouraged men to serve was the culture in which they had been raised. In 19th and early 20th century Germany, obedience ranked high on the list of virtues. Reverence for the head of the family, the rabbi, the teacher, the Kaiser had been instilled in them since boyhood. Individuality was neither encouraged nor valued. Often, it was not tolerated. Mm. One Michelin naval officer was educated at a strict Prussian school and punished by his father on the rare occasions when he didn't excel there. Though fighting for the Fuhrer often didn't save family members or the soldier himself, the odds of surviving the Russian front weren't much better than those of surviving Hitler's concentration camps. It did provide some less tangible compensations. For a man who feared for his loved ones, many did not know where their families were or what had become of them. The unit in which he served could be a surrogate family. In a world where institutions were crumbling, the military represented perhaps the last bastion of stability and cohesion. Like the Waffen SS officer above, many felt strong bonds with the men they fought beside, suffered with, and relied on, despite the knowledge that those same trusted comrades might have turned on them had they known of their Jewish blood. Man. One Navy captain, who believed a man is duty-bound to serve his country, 
felt such a strong bond with his former comrades that after the war he attended veterans reunions. Wow. So as you can see, folks, and if you don't know, folks, uh, we are covering this article, which is not that long, but the Jews who fought for Nazi Germany. And I'm sure you did not see this coming as, uh, as was meant to be. I decided that no one should see what I was about to offer thee, uh, only because, uh, you know, uh, the last show seemed to have been almost uh, plotted against. And so uh, I really wanted you to see this. And uh, well, that's that's how it went. So uh, this is the Doug Wright Show. Thank you so much. It's uh, 948 uh, in the evening on the 25th of November 2023. It's Sabbath. Yeah, listen to me. If you like what you hear, if you like what you see, use those things down there. And uh, particularly the Cash App, the Cash App, it's right there. I think, yeah, can I follow the Cash App? Look at that. Hey, use that right there. Yep. Uh, I'd love to pay uh, the people I owe. Uh, I owe a lot, just so you know. I'm walking on faith. I'm walking on fumes. And if they bury my body, please don't exhume. Okay, I'll leave the room. No, I won't. All right, we're going to keep this going. Uh, just so you know, and I'm going to be here for as long as my uh, computer runs, as long as my mouth runs, which means we'll be here a long, 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 long time. Please like, subscribe, and share it. Another painful, perhaps unanswerable question arises. Did those men who served know of the camps? Clearly, many of them did. Witness the claims that they were trying to save their relatives or themselves from that fate. But knowing of the existence of the camps was not the same as grasping the reality of mass murder. Around the world, people with more access to information than military personnel concerned with immediate survival could not imagine a nation would set out to systematically murder millions of its own citizens. Well, let me give you a little breakdown on how that uh, happened, because I think it's important you know. Uh, Hitler was uh, astute enough to gather only those uh, vile enough to stick their nose in such vile activity, those without a conscience, those without proclivity, those, you know, that uh, would do the dirty work and do it well, did the work without a hard sell. Those are the folks he gathered in a very small core, and you got to be understanding and be certain and sure. When he, when he, when he compartmentalized the group of assassins and got all the folks together, he was massing. He did the death just so and just right, and usually a lot of the bodies burned at night. But uh, you know, they did get folks that uh, kind of surveyed the place, and then they put all the horror in the village's face that surrounded the places where the bodies burned and. Through that tour, they thought the citizens might learn. I don't know. What's wrong with me? Well, it's the Doug Wright Show. Let's continue. One officer who later moved to Canada joined a synagogue and was circumcised at the age of 40. Ouch! Spoke for many when he said rumors of the facts were too outrageous to be believed. Still another reason for a Jew to serve was rooted in the religion for which he was persecuted. Perhaps only observant Jews could verbalize it, but the less observant and those who didn't identify as Jews knew it instinctively. A rabbinical parable tells of two men in the desert who have only enough water to save one of them. If they share it, both will die. Halacha mandates that one's own life takes priority. The man with the water must drink it. Stop. Whoa. Just just pump the brakes, all right? For goodness sakes. Whether that's even a known unknown, it just has an obviousity shown of vile equivocation. Man, that's a, that's an evil little nation. Halacha mandates that one's own life takes priority. Okay. All right. I just... After the war, the Jewish men who had fought for Hitler had to wrestle with the cost of their survival. Some did not find it too high. 
They went on to good careers, loving wives, and happy children. Among them were a founder of a German publishing house, a successful Berlin businessman, and a NASA engineer. Yeah, buddy. Who boy, they just went in there and they cleaned up, didn't they? Good lives, murderers, all whitey then. Some wrestled with their pasts. One half Jew speaks of being an outcast, misunderstood by both Germans and Jews. Others, like the man who moved to Canada, tried to reclaim the Jewishness his Jewish mother had denied him. Another veteran declared himself a lucky bastard to have survived, but admitted to years of traumatic memories. So let me put it to you this way as I pause for the cause and just jack my jaws. Look, uh, don't get shook. These are the same people, man. These are Canaanites, all right? These, you know what makes it easier for them? Skin tone. They ain't shim, right? I mean, all you gotta do is use your sight. You, you understand the blending, the, 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 the marginalization, the mitigation, the just how they can just, you know, just kind of go in between their nations. And they look of the same tone, because if they were Negroes, they'd be on their own. There'd be no forgiveness. There'd be no assent. And there'd be nothing but pursuit without relent. So we know through the shows we've done that, you know, where their genetics empirically run, and it's and it aligns with all the same kind. I don't know what's going through their minds. That's the reason they can forgive one another. That's the reason they can call each other brother. Stop. I'm talking to myself at this point. All right, folks, let's continue in this joint. Occasionally, irony intruded. After the war, one Michelin Wehrmacht soldier, perhaps in atonement for his service, immigrated to Israel to fight for its independence. To the Nazis, he had been a Jew because his father was. To the Israelis, he was a Gentile because his mother was a Christian, and Jewish law traces religion through the mother. He could fight for the new state, but not be a member of its people. Stop. Jewish law, Jewish law. We got we to gotta pause for that cause, because there's got to be more. <laughs> Jewish law traces genealogy through the mother, but as... Hebrews, we know the genealogy and the fact that you're a Hebrew is traced through the father. Do you see how bipolar, opposite, and dichotomous these uh, folks are to Ottomans to us? Uh, you know, I mean, it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, wow, I, I thought of that somehow before, but uh, when it's brought up like this, it's hard to ignore. Uh, the Jewish a belief is that the Jewish law traces religion through the mother. Wow, there's no other way. These folks are absolutely the other. Oh, let's keep going. <laughs> yeah. Heartbreak, however, was a more common fate. Many of the men who had served in Hitler's military were met with fury and ostracism. An officer, hoping to put his past behind him by emigrating to South America, asked a Berlin rabbi for help, but when the rabbi found out about his military service, he turned his back on the Jew killer. Another was told by his aunt in Palestine that it would have been better if he died in a camp, as millions of their co-religionists had. Okay, well, hold up now. I mean, does that not mirror somehow what we see on the streets in New York? You heard that dude who worked for Obama talk, and he also took the perp walk. All right, I'll stop. Then there are those who cannot speak of the cost of their choices. Many of them perished on the Russian front or in other hellholes of the war. Though I have unearthed no statistics, I don't think it's unreasonable to suspect that more than a few ended as suicides. It would be easy from the distance of close to a century to condemn those Jews who fought for a bestial regime sworn to exterminate the Jewish people. Certainly many of their contemporaries did. But for those of us who were not there, Hillel the Elder's words serve as a warning. Do not judge your fellow human beings until you have stood in their shoes. 
Ellen Feldman, a 2009 Guggenheim Fellow, is the author of the novel Paris Never Leaves You. All right. Well, wasn't that pleasant? Wasn't that nice? I did like that so, Mr. Rice. Yeah, I don't talk to myself in the third person, so relax. I'm not self-immersing. Oh, goodness. What a show. Tonight was very, very good. Uh, I like uh, how it went because it went as it should. Uh, this was, to me, an expose and said so much more than it needed to say. It was, if I might interplay, the Jews who fought for Nazi Germany, traitors or survivors, cowards or brave men, fools or wise heaters of Jewish parables on the sanctity of each individual life by Ellen Feldman. Guggenheim fellow. All right. Yeah, that's it, folks. Thanks so much. That's the end of the jokes. My name is Doug Rice. So nice you can say it twice. I am host of the Doug Rice Show, and I am done for the day. Just so you know, it's been a pleasure to talk to each of you. And now I bid you adieu, adieu. But if, again, you have to be out there in public places. Do me a favor, would you? Get that goddamned grin off your faces. I do appreciate it again. Dice! So nice I say it twice because that's what I do. Oh, okay. I'm leaving. All right. Bye. Jesus. Guys, rush people. <laughs> <laughs>